Let's look at the difference quotient, which is right here in number one. Okay. It's an easy four step process. If you're willing to go through it step by step, you're likely to get this correct. Okay, now as you know, over here, how about over here? I'm going to write the difference quotient, which is f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And what this does is <clears throat> it tells you uh, this in if this were real life it it would be something a lot uglier than that and what it does is it tells you how fast um, this is growing or shrinking depending on what you're measuring okay and uh, so these are just practice problems to teach you how how you know what the basic steps are for getting it so we already have f of x. What we need now is f of x plus h. And all that means is that in x, I write x plus h. We've covered this before. And I believe it was on your last exam. But it never becomes easy. OK, so anyway, I'm plugging X plus H in where X would normally be. Um, and then I'm going to work out. I'm going to work it all out. So this will be X squared plus hx plus hx minus 9. My gosh, that's easy. All right, x squared plus 2hx minus 9. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, no wonder I left something out. Something very important. Let me have another drink of coffee. That will help. I forgot h square, which could be kind of important. And it really means I probably need to stop talking to you, but it's important that I do because I want to remind you that h stands for a very, very small number. OK, and as the person doing the research, you would know exactly what h is. But because H usually has a lot of decimal places, um, it's easier just to write the letter H than it is to keep repeating uh, 0. 0.00001, for instance. So rather than do that, we're just writing this. Now, Now this is correct. OK, so now now we know what f of x plus h is. It's x squared plus 2hx plus h squared minus 9 because the minus 9 was already there. All right, now we have to find out what f of x plus h minus f of x is. 
and it's so much easier if you go in steps. f of x plus h minus f of x is what goes on top of this fraction. It's the numerator. So it's easier to work it out in its own separate step. So f of x plus h is x squared plus 2hx plus h squared minus 9. And then we're subtracting f of x, which is x squared minus 9. Okay, so here, here we have f of x plus h, and we're subtracting f of x. Okay, the reason I'm putting parentheses around these is that I'm going to be distributing the minus sign, and if you don't do that, you're going to get this wrong. So we'll have x squared plus 2hx plus h squared minus 9 minus x squared plus 9. And where does the plus come from? Comes from minus times minus, okay? So, now we combine our like terms. x squared minus x squared is 0, and negative 9 plus 9 is 0. So, what we're left with is 2hx plus h squared. See, and the x squareds are gone, and the 9s are gone. So, 2hx plus h squared. That's what's left. So now, we can find the difference quotient f of x plus h minus f of x over h equals, okay, we found out what that equals, it equals this. And then we divide by h. But to do that, back in beginning algebra, when you learned about polynomial division, um, when you have a, a binomial, a trinomial, a full polynomial divided by a monomial, you, you break this down into two fractions, 2hx over h plus h squared, which is h times h over h. These are equivalent statements. Now, the H's cancel out here, and the H's cancel out here, and what you're left with is 2X plus H. And so there you go. There's the answer for those of you writing it down. Or these, of course, are going to be available to you. Also, in Module 10, Module 10 is going to be chock full of stuff. Okay, now, open for requests. Is there any particular problem that gave you fits? Number 10. Number 10. Okay, we've got a television set. 
Let's see, I'm, I'm just going to copy it. And this is number 10. Okay, best thing to do when you've got a word problem is draw a picture, just so you understand. So I'm going to draw a kind of a picture of a television set. And this is the height and this is the length. And this is the diagonal. And the diagonal is 26 inches long and the length is 14 inches more than the height. So however long the height is plus an additional 14 inches. And what we have to do is find the dimensions. We have to find the height we have to find the length. And so we're going to use a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Yeah. All right, usually the vertical side of a triangle because you have a triangle here. Badly drawn, but a, a triangle, um, a, a, a right triangle in particular, um, is the vertical side is A. Usually the horizontal side is B and the diagonal side is always C. This has to be the C. So we are going to have H squared plus H plus 14 squared <laughs> equals 26 squared. So we'll have H squared plus H plus 14 times H plus 14. Now is the time for the calculator. You can get this free for 90 days. Um, I'm surprised it let me sign up for another 90 days. I didn't have to change my name or anything. Will it always be like that? I have no idea. Okay, are we clearing? Stop that. Second, quit. Thank you. I want to find out what 26 squared is. 676, and while we're at it, how about 14? 196. Okay, now I am going to attempt to make this smaller just so I have room. All right, so 676. Well, it didn't do any good anyway. H squared plus H squared plus 14H plus 14H plus 196. Yes. Plus 196, which is 14 squared, 
equals 676. And so combining like terms, we have 2H squared plus 28H plus 196 equals 676. And then, of course, this is a quadratic equation, so I subtract 676 from both sides. so that I get a zero over here. So I'll have 2H squared plus 28H plus zero. No, oh, don't do this. You know I'll screw up. Come on. Okay, 196 minus 676, which will give me minus 480. Well, oh, okay, nah. Keep it simple. Minus 480. Okay, now, I wanna make sure that was right. Okay. All right, now take out your GCF. Two will go into two, two will go into 28, and two will go, go into 480. So we're going to pull it out as the greatest common factor. And since it's an equation, we can divide out the two. Yes, divide both sides by two. So our numbers will be smaller and we will be, I will be less likely to make an arithmetic mistake. I hate arithmetic. H squared plus 14H minus 240. Now, in all likelihood, I see it right now, this is a factorable polynomial, um, quadratic uh, uh, trinomial. Uh, so I look, there's a one in front of the h squared. So all I have to do is look at negative 240 and factor it into two factors that add up to positive 14, the number in the middle. So, since I notice that negative 240 is going to equal 24 times negative 10, and 24 plus negative 10 is positive 14, I know how this will break up to my advantage. Um, the reason I did that so easily is that looking at 240, I can see that it will break down into these two numbers times 10. That zero means 10. So what I'm trying to write there, 240, there, lots of room, is the same thing as 24 times 10. It's much better than that. Except it's negative 240. So now you get a negative number by multiplying a negative times a positive. One of these has to be negative, so let's let the 10 be negative, so that when I add these together, I get positive 14. Now, because of the one in front of the h squared, I get to do the easy form of grouping. 
the easier, faster form of grouping, which is this. Positive 24 minus 10. Okay, and then the way you solve quadratic equations is you set both factors equal to zero. So h plus 24 equals zero, and h minus 10 equals zero. Subtract 24 from both sides. And that will leave me 24 minus 24 is zero. I will have H equals negative 24, which in the context of this problem, this problem, where we're trying to find the length of sides, a negative number makes no sense. so I'm not going to pay attention to it. On the other hand, a positive 10 negative 10 plus 10 is 0. That will give me h equals 10. This is the only answer that makes sense. So I am going to surmise that h equals 10 so it's 10 inches high. And um, since the length is H plus 14, that will be 10 plus 14, which is 24. Kind of, kind of an odd shaped little television. 10 inches by two feet. I don't know. Could work. Okay, there you go. There's number 10, your number 10. Now, more requests. This is the best way to handle it. Problems, hopefully you've already looked over the practice exam since the practice exam is this week. And you figured out what kinds of problems would give you trouble. Can you go over 21? I get the math correct but I'm always getting the graph wrong. Okay, let's see. There is something wrong with all of these problems, so it's not you. Um, yes, yes, and so am I gonna make you do it on the test? No, I'm gonna take it out. Oh, thank goodness. Yes. Okay, got any others? Yeah, the grapher isn't working. Um, I did it uh, on Saturday, and that's how I discovered that, you know, it just gives you a straight line. Any other problems give you a problem? Well, if not, let's go through these and look at some hard ones. But then again, what I would call hard might not be what you would call hard because everyone is different. Okay, so we did one, let's go back to two. Ah, how about a quadratic equation? Anybody have trouble with those? I'll tell you what the most common error is. The most common error 
is that you get two answers and um, one of them is wrong. What one of them is um, ex extraneous. One of them is extraneous and one is not, which is why you have to check your answers. So when you put down both answers and only one answer is the correct answer, you get half credit. So let's do it. It can't hurt. It looks pretty short. There it is. Okay, we have to solve this. What was this? What number was this? Number two. Your number two is different from their number two. I'm devastated. Okay. Um, I want to square both sides, but... I can't do it yet. I need to get the square root all by itself. So what I'm going to do is add 4 to both sides in order to move the 4 over by the 6. Now, that will zero out the 4 over here, and I'll be left with the square root of y plus 1 equals 10. So now I can square both sides to get rid of the, the radical. So I'll have y plus 1 equals 100. Well, goodness, it can't be that easy. How unexciting. 1 minus 1 is 0, so you're left with a y, equals 99. Is that true? Yeah, it is. You can check it in your head. I apologize for putting something that easy in here. It's beneath your intelligence. Okay, so we have 10 minus 4 equals 6. 10 minus 4 is 6. We have 6 equals 6. Aha! We can go with 99. So 99 is the answer. No challenge involved. Well, let's see what else there is. How are you with transformations? I wouldn't mind if you went over that again. This one? Okay. Here we have g of x. This is number three. Minus three, okay. Okay, let's analyze it first. 
this number out here, whatever it is, is going to be either the vertical shift, uh, vertical stretch or shrink. that right there. Okay, now a stretch is a number greater than one, so I'm going to say in greater than one, where in is just number, any number. A shrink is when you've got a number less than one. In other words, a fraction, but greater than zero. So this is going to be a vertical shrink by a factor of one third. Vertical shrink by a factor of one third. The number out here on the far right is your vertical shift, up or down. OK, a plus three would have been a vertical shift up three units. But it's a minus three. A minus three is down three units. Now, what we have to do is also figure out, well, what is the basic graph? The basic function. The basic function is going to be h of x equals the absolute value of x. And the absolute value of x always looks like a v. Sh comes to a sharp point. Now the basic graph comes to that sharp point at zero, zero. But this of course has been shrunk vertically and it's been um, move down three units. Now let's take this information back here. All right, start with the graph h of x equals the absolute value of x. Then, now you don't know what this is, so let's read the context. It is ah, shrunk or stretched vertically by a factor of OK, so the number in front is your vertical stretch or shrink. That's a fraction, so it's going to be a vertical shrink. And by a factor of whatever that number is, this will be 1 divided by 3, 1 third. And then finally, shift it. Up three, down one third, down three, up one third. Well, your vertical shift will only be three, either up or down, and that minus means down, so down three. So without even having to use a graphing calculator, I know that the V is going to be moved down three units. So let's let's make this bigger. All 
All right, notice the scale. This is 10 by 10. Um, the scale is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So this, that's 2 right there. That's 4. So halfway between 2 and 4 is 3. So here's a V that's been shifted down 3 units. And it's, um, it's, uh, you don't have a, a sharp V like that. You have a V where the arms have been lowered, which is precisely what a vertical shrink does. It, it'll cause the arms to go lower, which also widens them out. Now, if you know how to use your graphing calculator, you can graph it and get a better idea. So let's clear all that. Let's go to y equals and clear that. And so we will have parentheses, one divided by three, parentheses closed. Math, and then right arrow key takes you to abs, which is absolute value. So I'll hit enter there an X. Oh, not silly. I have to type the X there and then hit the right arrow key to move outside the absolute value bars and then minus three. And then you can graph that. The best way to graph it is by hitting the zoom button and then six because that automatically gives you a 10 by 10. Now the scale doesn't look the same, but you can go back into window and if you want to, you can change the vertical scale, the Y scale to two and the X scale because that's the same. You can make this graph look exactly exactly like the graph. Um, no. Exactly like that graph right there. So graphing it is the easiest way to figure out which of the graphs is the correct one, but you have to have the right scale, you have to have the right endpoints in order to make it look like this picture, like one of these pictures. So you have to be a little careful there. Okay, let us, oh. Okay. Okay, another question. Okay, I'll look. Okay, this is another one. This is another, um, this is number four. Four times the square root of X. Again, minus three, how boring. Again, you have a basic function, the square root of X. You have a number in front, which is going to be a vertical stretch or shrink, and you have a number behind, which will be a vertical shift up or down. Now here, this is a number greater than one. Four is greater than one. So this is going to be a vertical stretch.
And this, again, just like up here, we're going to have a vertical shift down. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, so now just a quick a quick graph. Oops, that is so bad. All right. Um, the graph of the square root of X looks like this. Rises slowly. In fact, I'm even making it rise more quickly. Now with with a vertical stretch in front of it. It's going to go up more. But, aha, it's going down three units. So this blue guy is going to go down. Down like that. All right, so this is it right here. And that would be the graph we're looking for. Or getting out the trusty graphing calculator again. Go to Y equal, hit clear. Now I've got four times second X squared gives me, oops, we need it bigger. 4 square root x. Now you've got to take the right arrow key and move to the outside before you hit minus 3 because the minus 3 is on the outside of the radical. Now I've already changed what the window looks like, so let's just graph it. See, your graphing calculator doesn't always give you a good graph, but this is the best it can do. At least it gives you an idea. Mine is better for a change. All right, let's take a look at the problem then. Start with the graph of h of x equals the square root of x, then do something to it by a factor of. Whenever you see the word factor, you're, de you're dealing with a vertical stretch or shrink, which will be this number. So we're going to shrink it vertically, not this time. We're going to stretch it horizontally, no. We're going to stretch it vertically by a factor of four. And then finally, we're going to shift it down three because of that minus three. Oh, and we don't have to graph it. Okay. Even better. So, okay, let's go on. For as much time as we have, um, solve quadratic equations. Okay, I wouldn't do this if this were a typical easy problem. But it has a twist, like many things. In life. Okay, 5x squared plus 35 equals zero. I'm going to, whenever you notice, notice this is what you have.
this middle term is absent without leave. It's not there. All you've got is the quadratic term and the constant term, and that's it. When you do, you solve like this. Subtract 35, subtract 35, so that 5x squared equals negative 35. Then this is 5 times x squared, so we can divide it out. It's not trapped in any parentheses. So we're going to have x squared equals negative 7. Then to, to find out what x equals, we have to get rid of the square by doing the opposite or the inverse. We take the square root of both sides, put a plus or minus in front of the square root of the constant so that x is going to equal plus or minus the square root of negative 1 times 7, which is x equals plus or minus the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 7. You can do that when there's multiplication or division under the radical. If there's addition or subtraction, you can't do it. Um, okay, plus or minus. The square root of negative 1 is i times the square root of 7. And so um, these are the zeros of the function or the solutions of the quadratic equation right here. We have two complex conjugate solutions. Okay, so don't make your negative disappear. Notice that we had negative seven here and when I took the square root of both sides, I said plus or minus square root and that negative is with the seven. You can't make it disappear. So you have to do this. Negative seven is negative one times positive seven the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 7. The square root of negative 1 is i. So this is i times the square root of 7. Okay. So Let's see, I'm going to click on the plus or minus, and then I, yeah, and then the square root tool, and then seven. Let's see, yeah, all right. Kitty, excuse me. George is falling off. There. George, why don't you say hello to the nice people? There, I don't know if you can see him, but there he is. My friend. Okay, and this is a tricky one also, so let's do this. 
I hope you haven't waited to study. OK, this is going to be 2y to the third minus 5y squared minus 3y equals 0. This is a cubic notice, so don't be tempted to use the quadratic formula, for instance. We have to pull out a common factor first, and each term has a y. I want to number these. Number six. All right, each term has a Y, notice that. So, I pull it out as a common factor. No, I don't, it's not a two, it's a Y. I pull out the Y, that'll give me two Y squared minus five Y minus three equals zero. Now, if this had been a number, I could have just divided it out, but you can't divide out a variable. I'm going to set each factor equal to zero, y equals zero, and 2y squared minus 5y minus 3 equals 0. We're now going to have to solve this. You can use the quadratic formula, or I believe it's factorable, so we can factor it by the AC method, and it's a good thing to review the AC method as well. So, A is 2, a is 2, B is negative 5, C is negative 3. You would need to do that for the quadratic formula as well. Okay, 2 times negative 3 is negative 6, and negative 6 can be factored into negative 6 times positive 1, along with negative 2 times 3, negative 3 times 2, negative 1 times 6, but this is to our particular advantage because, now I can't say equals there, because they're not equal, what I'm about to do is say negative 6 plus 1, equals negative 5. And negative 5 is the B number. So, that's cool. That means that, oh, let's do it the easy way. 2y squared minus 3 equals 0. I am going to break this down into minus 6y plus 1y. Now minus 6y plus 1y is minus 5y. So I haven't changed the polynomial, I've just changed its form. So I put parentheses around the first two terms, parentheses around the second two terms. And I can see right away that there's a Y in both of these terms and a two in both of these terms. So I will pull out two Y. And that will leave me with Y minus three. And double checking, two Y times Y is two Y squared, two Y times minus three 
is minus 6y. So I did that correctly. Now, these two terms do not have a GCF, except positive 1, because minus 3 is the same thing as minus 3 times 1. So, 1 can always be a greatest common factor. Y times Y minus 1 times Y minus 3 equals zero. Now you've got a y minus three on the left of the plus sign, a y minus three on the right of the plus sign. Y minus three in parentheses now is your GCF. So I pull that out. Times the leftovers, which are two y plus one. OK, so let's go back here now. We'll have y minus 3 times 2y plus 1 equals 0, which means y minus 3 equals 0 and 2y plus 1 equals 0. Add 3 to both sides, you get y equals 3. This one, you have to actually go in steps. Minus 1, minus 1. That leaves me with 2y equals negative 1. Then I divide by 2 and I divide by 2. y equals negative 1 half. So now, let me see what the instructions were. That would help. The solutions are, okay. We'll have y equals zero, comma, three, comma, and negative, one divided by two. Yes. Okay. Save that. Okay, it's 837. I can go on for a while say until about nine, um, and see what happens. Seven, you're going to um, be solving another um, quadratic equation. You can factor it by the AC method, or you can um, uh, use the, the um, it might be that the AC method doesn't work, in which case you can use the quadratic formula. I would probably use it anyway, just because it looks difficult. Remember to um, move your three over by subtracting it from both sides. Now, find the zeros of the function, give exact answers and approximate answers. Okay, this is not factorable. You will have to use the quadratic formula. So let us use the quadratic formula. This is number eight. Okay, there's a one in front of the x squared. A equals one, B equals seven, 
C equals negative 5. And so X equals negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. That looks like a 9, so let me try to clean this up. Okay. Now it looks like a Y. Best I can do. Okay. Um, X equals B is seven. So negative seven plus or minus the square root of seven squared minus four times one times, well, times negative five, all over two A, which is two times one. So that will be negative seven plus or minus the square root of 49 minus, four times one is four. So minus four times negative five is plus 20. Over two, two times one is two. And that will be negative seven plus or minus the square root of 69 over two. Now let's look at 69 and see if it breaks down. 69, three goes into 69, 23 times, six, nine, yeah. Neither of these is a perfect square. In fact, they're both primes. So this won't break down, and that's your answer. You have, um, you can split them apart, which might be easier in my math lab to, um, okay, X equals, and now you're in your answer box, negative, seven minus the square root of 69 over two and negative seven comma, negative seven plus the square root of 69 over two. Now, those are the exact answers. the exact zeros, the exact solutions. See how they're wording this. Uh, find the zeros of the function. Okay, so these are the exact zeros. Not the kind of answer you take to lows. For that, you need the approximate answers. And the approximate answers need to be rounded to, let's see. Simplify your answer, use integers or fractions for any numbers. Type an exact answer using radicals and I as needed. Use a comma to separate the solutions. The approximate solutions to three decimal places. So we have to round to three decimal places.
OK, I'm going to do this in two steps just because it's easier. Um, I'll show this when it gets bigger. OK, negative 7 minus the square root of 69. All right, there we are. Come out with your right arrow key on your keyboard. OK. Oh. Well, I guess. Yeah, I could have used that, couldn't I? All right, I'm going to find out what this equals before I divide by two. Now I'm going to divide that by two. This gets rid of the need to use parentheses and it can just be easier. Um, okay, divide it by two. And then we need to round to one, two, three decimal places. So I look over at the fourth decimal place and ask myself, is that number five or greater? Well, clearly it's not, it's a three. Three will not cause this three to move up to a four. So my answer is going to be negative 7.653. Now I'm going to do the other, put the other um, zero. Into the calculator. And then divide by two. And again, look at that, 0.653 followed by a three, which we already said will not cause this three to move up to a four. So now let's check out how we would write the answers. All right, the exact solution. I am going to try this, okay? Negative seven. No, I'm already wrong. I need a f to use the fraction tool. Now, negative seven, and I'm gonna try this, plus or minus the square root of 69, right arrow key to move down over two. And then I'm going to put the answers in I just found. Um, negative 7.653. Only I'm putting it in the wrong place. Negative 7.653. Three, comma, point six five three. Let's see. Ah, I was sure I'd get something wrong there. All right. There you go, you're going to use U substitution for that one. There's the diagonal. Here's an open box. So there's a trick to that and I'm going to include this as well. This one the one that you have to use use substitution on 
is covered in the video from the other class that's in your module 10. I recommend you watch those two videos and this video. OK, so. Let's bring this picture over. You've got an open box, which is to be made from a 20 centimeter by 30 centimeter piece of tin. And the way you do that is you're going to cut squares out of each corner. And so you're going to let the uh, uh, length of the side of the square be X. Except, yeah, I have to flatten first. OK, now X. That's what your X is. The area of the resulting base. Now this is the base right here. The base of the box. That's what you get when you fold up what's left after you cut those corners out and send them to recycling or wherever. OK, now we know, all right, the area is 504 square centimeters. A equals 504. Let's just say 504 because it's the numbers we need. Now, after we've cut out the squares, the length is going to be 30 minus 2x. And the width is going to be 20 minus 2x. And so since the area of a rectangle, and this is a rectangle, equals the length times the width, this is what we do. We say 504, 504 equals 30 minus 2x times 20 minus 2x. And so 504 equals 30 times 20 is 1500, uh, is 600. 30, 20, 0, 0, 6, yeah. 600 minus 30 times minus 2x is minus 60x. Minus 2x times 20 is minus 40x. And minus 2x times minus 2x is plus 4x squared. So 504 equals 4x squared minus 100x plus 600. And then I subtract 504 from both sides. And what we get is 0 equals 4x squared 
minus 100x. Um, 10 minus 4 is 6. This will be a 9. That 60 turns into 59. 59 minus 50 is 9. And the bigger number is positive, so this is a plus. Now, I suspect that 4 is going to be our greatest common factor. I know for sure that 4 uh, goes into 100 evenly. Does it go into 96? Let us see. 4 into 96. 4 into 9 is 2. 2 times 4 is 8. 9 minus 8 is 1. Yes, it does. 4 into 16 is 4. So, what we have here is 4 times x squared minus 25 times 4 plus 24 times 4. So we can pull out a GCF, which is 4. 0 equals 4 parentheses x squared minus 25x plus 24. And then we divide out the GCF. We can do that only because we've got an equation. So zero equals x squared minus 25x plus 24, where 24, not five, 24, breaks down into 1 times 24 and negative 1 times negative 24. And if, if ha, I just can't get that 25 out of my mind. If I add negative 1 plus negative 24, I get negative 25. So woohoo, that's how I'm going to factor this. 0 equals boom, 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 boom. Split the x squared apart, x squared, I mean x, x, and then I'll have minus 1, minus 24. Set each factor equal to 0, x minus 1 equals 0, x minus 24 equals 0. And when I add 1 to both sides, I get x equals 1. When I add 24 to both sides, I get x equals 24. And now, all I have to do is see which one makes sense. x equals 24 does not make sense. Can you imagine the side of the square being 24, that would be longer than the whole width. No, you can't do that. This makes no sense given the context of the problem. But x equals 1 makes perfect sense. That's so going to be our answer. x equals 1. The side of the square is 1 centimeter. What is the length of the sides of the squares? One centimeter. Okay. We have gone way over. Study this video when it comes up in module 10 and the notes, as well as the videos and notes 
from the other class that are already there in module 10, and you will probably do pretty well on the test. I would guess you would, but the very, very best way to make an A or to pass the exam is to go through over and over and over again the practice exam. So do that. 